Good to be in the house of the Lord with you. My name is Trevor. I am the campus pastor here. And man, I'm honored to have you join us this morning. Our lead pastor, Narup, has two weeks left on his sabbatical. And so he will be back with us shortly. So let's just give an awkward sort of hi, Narup, all together. Hi, Narup. In the event that he is watching the stream, which he's not supposed to be doing. So, well, I am thrilled to be with you guys because we are continuing through our series, The King's Table. And in this series, we are exploring the letters of John. So 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Um, Don't worry, 2nd and 3rd John are like half a page long, so they won't take too long. And in this, we are exploring really what John says about what it means to sit at the table of the king, to be in fellowship with God and his people. So last week, we walked through uh, 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 11. And in this, John was showing us that when we talk about knowing Jesus, that it ought to lead to obedience. And that in John's view, obedience is not some sort of legalistic pursuit, but that obedience is pursuing congruence or conformity with the actions of Jesus. It is embodying him. And so this morning we are going to be in verses 12 through 17 of chapter 2. And throughout this series we have been honoring God's word by rising together as I read it. So would you guys stand with me for the reading of today's passage. 1 John chapter 2 verses 12 through 17. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And all the world is passing away along with its desires, but... Whoever does the will of God abides forever. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Isn't it funny how in life, the people who seem to know the least about a specific situation give some of the most detailed and impassioned advice? Perhaps you have a, a coworker who you have been lamenting with about disciplining your children some issue that you might be having, and they tell you about something that they saw in Dr. Phil that will cure that ale precisely. Or maybe you have had some sort of a health problem that you were sharing with a family member, and within a day you are getting uh, a, a Facebook post that is somebody who has a similar health condition that was able to cure it exclusively with olive oil and Himalayan sea salt, right? Or maybe, just maybe, you have an in-law, perhaps a mother-in-law, who likes to walk into your house and begin to point out how things should be organized as if she were Joanna Gaines. This does not happen with my mother-in-law, not at all. I say it because it's true, but I also make sure I clarify it because she often watches on Mondays. So, Kim, I love you, not talking about you. (laughs) There's something quite powerful, though. If somebody does know you, does know your situation, and gives helpful direction. Here in 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 17, this is exactly what John is doing. In the first half of this, he is telling his audience, I know you. I know something about you that you may not even know yourself. And because I know you, because I know your context, I'm going to give you some advice and some direction. And so this is what we are going to be walking through this morning. We're going to look through this in kind of the first two, um, or first three verses, so 12, 13, and 14, and then we will uh, move into verses 15, 16, and 17. So when we see this here, looking at these first three verses, John appears to be talking to three different groups of people. So he mentions children, he mentions fathers, and he mentions young men. 
Now, it is unlikely that John is actually referring to three segments. Rather, he's referring to two. Because as you read through 1 John, you will see that John is referring to everyone as children. So he uses it multiple times. This is his address for the whole congregation. And so the things that he says about children really should be applied to both the categories of fathers and young men. So he addresses fathers and young men and then sort of everyone collectively. Now, we need to make sure that we note this here, that the language pattern of the first century world, that any time there was a mixed group of people, so mixed being men and women, um, they would use male nouns or pronouns to address them. And so this is not John excluding women, the, the, everything that we know, that men and women were worshiping together in the first century in Ephesus. And so this is an inclusive type of um, statement about both the, the, the men and the women who belong to this congregation. And then finally, these people that he is addressing is, is, is probably doesn't have anything to do with a spiritual maturity, so not young in your faith, old in your faith. It was actually quite common in antiquity to, when you were writing, if you were a philosopher um, or, or someone that was in some sort of ministerial position to address different age groups. So you see this a lot with uh, some of the Greco-Roman philosophers that they would have statements for the young and the old. So we should really think about this as those who are young in age and those who are mature in age. So if these are the people he's talking to, really this segment of young and this segment of those who are mature in age we want to make sure that we understand specifically what he's saying. So let's start with those statements to children. This is uh, what he's saying to everyone. He says, children, I'm writing to you because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. And, as we see in verse 13, because you know the Father. So he says, your sins are forgiven. If you read the book of the Gospel of John, you will see in chapter 1 that John does something very intentionally. He has this, this sort of episode that he includes of John the Baptist seeing Jesus. And John the Baptist lets out this very blatant statement that captures what John the Apostle had come to understand about Jesus. He says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so when John is writing his gospel and when he is writing this letter, he puts at the forefront the forgiveness of sin. So he says, children, your sins are forgiven. And then he says, you know the Father. We will see here in a few moments why this is such a significant and weighty thing to say. To the fathers, or to those who are mature in age, he says, I write to you because you know him who is from the beginning. He repeats this twice in verse 13 and verse 14. Perhaps the fathers in the congregation would have been saying, could you not have come up with something more descriptive than just repeating the same thing twice? But that is what he did. So he says, I write to you because you know him who is from the beginning. So the question that we should be asking is who is the one that is from the beginning? And if you look at the very first two verses of this letter, John tells us, this is his phrase for referring to Jesus. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. So when he addresses those who are mature in age, he says, you know him who was from the beginning. This thing that we have all been talking about, been brought together by, you know him. He is close to you. And so if we couple that with the statements that he makes towards children, He's saying, your sins have been forgiven, you know the Father, and you know Jesus Christ, the Son. Now to the young. He says, I write to you because you have overcome the evil one, and then he says, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. He says it twice there. 
Now, strong here probably is referring to a uh, spiritual strength in context with overcoming the evil one. John is, is not congratulating them on successfully completing another round of P90X. And so he says, you are strong. And then he says this thing that's interesting. He says, the word of God abides in you. Now, our, instinctually, we might think that this is a reference to the Bible um, because that's how we refer to Scripture often as the word of God abiding in you. But at this point, the, the, the New Testament was still being written and, and formed and put together. And um, the Old Testament really wouldn't have been thought about in that way. They would have actually, uh, the Jewish audience would have thought about it in three segments. So, you know, you've had the, the prophets and the writings and the law. And so what he is referring to, and you have to kind of read all of John, uh, his writings uh, to appreciate this, is that the word of God is the message of Jesus and Jesus' own embodiment of that message. So when he says that the word of God abides in you, he is saying the message of Jesus, Jesus himself abides in you. And then he says this interesting thing about overcoming the evil one. Now, there, there's certainly lots of speculation, and what I'm going to offer is speculation because we really don't know why he says this. But one of the things that if you read all of the First John, and you'll see this next week, um, is that there were, were these false teachers that were beginning to say things that like perhaps Jesus isn't the Messiah, um, perhaps G there is no death required for the forgiveness of sins, and they were creating this kind of offshoot of something that wasn't really Christianity, and this has been true for all of human history, but if somebody wants to start a cult or an offshoot religion, they normally target the young. And so perhaps the reason that John commends them is because they have stayed in the community, they have stayed close to what is true. And so if we look at what he says to the young, he says, your sins have been forgiven. You know the Father. He says, you have the word of God abiding in you, so you know the Son, and you are strong and have overcome the evil one. So it's important here really quickly that we compare both of these lists, because at first it appears as if these things are actually quite different. But side by side, we'll see that really he is saying the same thing in a different way. He says to the mature, your sins are forgiven, you know the Father, and you know the Son, which he says using that phrase, him who is from the beginning. To the young, he says, your sins are forgiven, you know the Father, you know the Son, which he uses, the word of God abides in you. And then he offers that little clarifying bit about them overcoming the evil one. Now, perhaps as you hear this, your sins are forgiven, you know the Father, you know the Son, those unifying messages, it feels like sort of generic religious jargon. Like perhaps John just got on Spotify, looked up Elevation Worship, ripped off a couple of lyrics, and sent it to them in a letter. But if you really understand John's theology and what he tries to convey about Jesus and his gospel, you will realize that telling both the mature and the young, that you know the Father and you know the Son is not just him being redundant, is not just him trying to be really nice and make sure he covers all of his theological bases, but he is conveying something of profound significance. In John chapter 14, this being in John's gospel, he is recording Jesus giving this really detailed explanation about our relationship with him, our relationship with the Father, our relationship with the Holy Spirit. And in verses six, six through seven, he says this thing that connects pretty directly with this statement that you know the Father and you know the Son. Jesus was saying, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So here when Jesus is talking with his disciples, he is letting them see something that is quite important. He says that by knowing him, we know the father. By seeing him, we see the father. And that Jesus is the access point to that life. That he is the way. That he is the truth. That he is the life. And so when John is telling these people, you know the father, you know the son, 
He is telling them that you are walking in the way. You have received the truth. You are living the life. He's telling them that that significant, profound reality that Jesus was talking about in John 14, they were occupying it. They were in it. Now, for the Jews that were in attendance, this would have been monumental. For the Jewish people had waited for ages for a Messiah to come. They waited through slavery. They waited through exile, through the rising and falling of corrupt kingdoms. And here, John was telling them, in your midst, knowledge of the Father and the Son is happening around you, and you're a part of it. To the Gentiles that would have been receiving this, this would have been astounding. Because you see, they grew up in a culture that was obsessed with having an encounter with the divine. They had countless pantheons filled with gods for everything. They had religious mythology. They had cultic practices that all promised that you could get closer to the divine. And these Gentiles who had converted to Christianity, they were finding that every one of these attempts left them with nothing. And now, here, John is saying, the way, the truth, the life, that seed of desire that you've always had is fulfilled in your midst. John was telling Jews and Gentiles that were a part of this community that they had arrived. He was saying what you have been hoping for, what you've been longing for, what your soul has been needing, it's here. You've arrived. You and I have grown up in a culture that is all too familiar with Jesus. So whether you grew up in the church or you merely grew up in a Western uh, setting, you will have had plenty of exposure to the ideas of Christianity. But for this first century world, they were being told something that would have stopped them. They would have said, you're telling me I don't have to strive anymore? You're telling me that I don't have to keep looking, that this is it? And John says, yes, you have arrived. And so now that John has demonstrated that he knows something about the context they were living in, he knows something of their situation, he's going to give them some very important instruction on how they should live in light of it. He begins in verse 15. He says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So he begins with this really clear instruction, do not love the world. And then he offers this conditional statement. We talked about conditional statements last week. If we see a conditional statement in Scripture, a, a statement that either uses um, if and then logic, so, you know, if you eat this, then you will be full. Uh, full. Um, or if it just uses, uh, if it uses those words exactly, or if it's just that sort of logic, we need to pay attention because these are weighty statements that they teach us about an important reality. And here, John is trying to teach us about an important reality. And that reality is, is that if we love the world, then the love of the Father is not in us. Now, it might feel for a second like John has made a really sharp transition. Like, weren't we just having a really nice time, John? You were sitting down and telling us that we had arrived, that things were good, that we had the way, the truth, and the life that was, that was being birthed up in us, and it, it was great. And now you're saying, don't love the world. If you love it, the love of the Father is not in you. But I believe that why John is saying this is actually completely connected to the previous few verses, and the previous few verses actually motivate him saying this. Because you see, you and I, we have a fundamentally broken nature. We have a nature that longs for things that are good, and upon receiving that, often exchange them for things that are not. See, we are the people who wait for marriage, only to treat it as a contract and exchange it for interest and work entertainment, or perhaps someone else. We are a people who anticipate the day of owning a home, only upon closing to begin to long for one that is larger or in a better zip code. We are the people who long for children only to develop habits of dismissing their interests and treating them like common annoyances. 
You see, part of our nature is that we receive that which is good and we exchange it for that which is not. And so when John tells them, you have received this beautiful reality, you have arrived in this dramatic way, he's telling them, don't trade it. Don't walk into something else. John is telling them, you who have arrived, be careful to remain. For those of you who are familiar with Pastor Narup, often he sings songs from the 90s, just kind of works them in. I believe this would be an appropriate time to sing a 90s song. I was thinking, Don't Go Chasing Waterfalls by TLC. <laughs> However, the Lord has not blessed me with any vocal performance, so we're going to keep moving. So he tells them, Remain. He tells them, you have come into this beautiful reality. God is doing something. You're in the way. You're in the truth. You're in the life. Don't depart from it. And then he actually grounds this in some pretty significant logic. He says in verse 16, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. So he says, don't leave this place that you're in. Because there is going to be something that is going to try to draw you away, to encourage you to leave. And he lists these three things. He says the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride of life. When John is talking about the desire of the flesh, flesh here really means probably kind of a neutral term. Anything that pertains to human desire. So anything that is having to do with human physicality, things like hunger, sex, desire for rest, desire for security, comfort, connection, these things, he says, can stand in the way of our love for the Father. The desires of the eyes. He's talking about eyes, certainly, not in a literal sense like the organ that is in your head, but the poetic concept of our vision. The way in which our beholding connects with that flesh that we possess. And I think he makes special note of this because there is something quite problematic with our vision. You see, our vision looks at food and drink and it evokes gluttonous desire. It sees what is visible and yet it ignores what isn't visible. Things like unseen health concerns, and the emotional consequences that come from overuse. Our vision looks at items in a store. It sees the visible, and it ignores the not-so-visible, things like the financial cost, the space it will occupy, or how a particular item might change our behavior. Our vision looks at that which is visible, like a person's sexually appealing characteristics. It ignores the less than visible, things like their humanity, their history, and their hope for redemption. John knows that our vision is particularly challenging for embracing the love of God, and so he says, beware the desires of the eyes. And then finally he says, we ought to be careful of the pride of life. Now, This phrase, if you have grown up in the church, has had, people have a lot to do about this phrase. A lot of people will preach an entire sermon uh, about this specific phrase and try to unpack. Um, I'm not going to do that because I think that it really is, it's kind of a common expression that is trying to say um, the things that come from being in this world. So really narrowly, that word for life in Greek can mean um, the physical possessions of this life. But the context kind of warrants that it would be extended to the lifestyle, things that come from being in this world, things like achievements, status, position. So John says that there is a sort of pride that stems from this reality. Now it's interesting what John does when he talks about the flesh, when he talks about the eyes, and he talks about life. It is this sort of, these concentric circles, these expanding environments. And so he talks about the flesh which is closest to us, that we experience whether we're looking at something or not. And then he talks about the eyes, which connects us with our environment around us, and it reveals some of those desires of the flesh. And then he mentions life, 
the things of this world, this way of being in our larger environment around us. And he says, at every level of the human experience, there is a temptation to not remain, to not stay in this place in which you've arrived. Now, I want to be careful here, because John is not saying that the flesh, that the desires that are sometimes a part of, of what we behold, or life itself is bad. All of these things are certainly impacted by sin, but each and every one of these environments, it contains something that God has made good that has been corrupted. You see, John spends a lot of time in his gospel trying to show his audience that Jesus possessed human flesh, that he embodied our humanity, and he enjoyed being human. He lived the full human experience, except he did it without sin. And so John is not condemning these things in and of themselves. What he is saying is we cannot love these things. Now, love here is not about a feeling, right? Like, I love cake, or my wife loves Target, or my wife loves Target. <laughs> or another example, my wife loves Target. <laughs> not like this. He's not talking about some sort of emotion. He's talking about an emotion that leads to devotion. He's talking about a reordering of our affect in a way that it changes what we behold and what we worship. And so when he says, do not love the world, he isn't saying that you can't enjoy your life. He isn't saying that you can't have gratitude for your accomplishments. He isn't saying that you can't enjoy human physicality. What he is saying is that when we begin to shift our devotion, our commitment, our fidelity, that we are stealing energy, priority, and passion, and we're stealing it from one person, from the Father. Now, the reason that this can happen or the way that this happens is generally in kind of one of two categories. The first is that our desire can lead to disobedience. So our desire is something that, that, that stems from our flesh, that gets kind of um, queued up by our vision, and this can lead to disobedience. So you want to have sex. That desire is good. It should not be shamed. It should not make you feel ostracized, but say that your desire grows and begins to test your obedience, and you pursue that desire in a context in which God is not ordained, perhaps in a relationship outside of marriage, perhaps through porn use. What has happened is that desire has led to you being one who has broken a commandment of God. And again, we talked last week that the commandments of God push us toward, towards obedience. We're being pushed towards obedience because when we obey, we're embodying Jesus in this world. And so our desires can get in the way of us embodying Jesus, living like him in this world. And that is a shame for us, and it is a problem for this world that desperately needs Jesus. And so he says, be careful because your desires can lead to a disobedience. But there's this second way that these desires that he talks about can impact our love for the Father. And it's when our affections grow to idolatry. Now, you might be thinking if you are a, uh, you know, a kind of a black and white logical thinker that, well, isn't idolatry a disobedience? Can't we just include that in the first category? I thought about that. I wrestled with it. Here we are with the second thing. Yes, idolatry is a form of disobedience, but idolatry doesn't come usually from being overwhelmed by some sort of passion or desire. It's actually much more subtle. You see, you and I will have affection, a good feeling towards many things in this life. Things like food, wealth, physical intimacy, security. Because we're human beings and we get something that supports us as human creatures, we are going to have some sort of satisfaction from food, some sort of comfort from having money in our savings account, some sort of security by having a, ho a roof over our heads, some sort of comfort from physical intimacy. We will have an affection towards these things, but over time, left unchecked, many of our affections may grow in such a way that they create idols out of the things that we love. 
Well, when I was in uh, undergrad, I, w- I went to a, a Christian undergrad, had an undergraduate degree um, in ministry, and I got a job at a church that was um, a l- little bit bigger than LifeGate here, and um, <clears throat> it was such a good job. It was such a good, I got paid really, really well. My wife and I were able to buy a house. Um, it was really close to the church. We had this really good life, and I had a lot of positive affection towards this job. But over time, some things began to happen, and I began to recognize that I didn't just appreciate the job because it provided for my family and I, because it allowed me to practice my giftedness, but I appreciated it because I was doing better than the people I went to undergrad with, that I got a job in, a, in an environment that was, everyone thought was really good and really awesome before everybody else did. And I got this sort of encouragement from the leaders who oversaw me at this job. And they began to pat me on the back, tell me I was doing awesome. So oh, we've never seen a guy that, that was this young, um, you know, look this good in sleeveless button-down shirts. I was like, wow. <laughs> me, a little farm kid from Indiana, never heard something so kind. Um, but it began to swell this affection into a desire for this job. And I realized after a couple of years of doing it that I was doing this job each and every day because of the job, because of the environment, because of the status, not because this is what God had called me to, not because this is where God was asking me to live and serve him. My affection grew an idol, and that idol impacted my heart. And so John says, be careful for these desires because they threaten us. They move us towards a place where we cannot possess the love of the Father. Now, he says that this in verse 17. This isn't just kind of for no reason. He says, no, actually, the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So he says, I'm not just telling you guys, like, don't engage in the desires of the world because, like, I don't want you to. But they're actually temporary. See, he says this in light of an eternal reality. John had a really clear vision for how the rest of human history was going to go. When Jesus ascended, he understood that Jesus began the kingdom of God's sort of presence on this earth. And that that kingdom would operate until the gospel was shared in whatever capacity the Father in heaven thought that it needed to be shared. And then when that time came, Christ would return, would judge sin and death, and then the eternal kingdom with the fully realized concept of what God wants human and his relationships to look like was going to break forth over the earth. And so John says, certainly in light of eternity, your desires are temporary. Certainly in light of everything that is happening, your desires are temporary. But he says something else. I think he, he's saying that they're temporary even right now. That the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is temporary even in this moment. See, I think for those of us who overuse alcohol, it's, it's hard to tell what is shorter, the, the buzz or the emotional lift it gives. Either way, both are quite short. For those of us whose actions are governed by sexual desire, those actions, they always seem to come with the highest highs, don't they? And the absolute lowest lows. For those of us who pursue money with great commitment, every bonus check, every successful stock sold, every dollar saved gives way immediately to the need for more. I think John says the desires of this world are passing away in light of this heavenly reality, but I think you and I also know that they're passing away even right now. And so listen, John, he writes this to this ancient people in a culture that is quite unlike ours. And yet here this sits before you and I today. Somehow through the Spirit's activity preserved for us, Because the message that John gave 2,000 years ago is the exact message that you and I need to hear. I think that we need to know that if we have knowledge of Jesus, the type of knowledge that leads to obedience and pursuing him, that we 
have arrived. I want you to hear that for a moment. You have arrived. This is what you were made for. This is where you will find your purpose. This is where sacrifice will lead to inexpressible joy, where hardship will find meaning. You have arrived. Now, I know that it may not always feel like this, because on one hand, we are in a sort of lifelong process of accepting, appreciating, and embracing what it means to know the Lord. But on the other hand, there are circumstances in our life that will dictate to us discouragement, fear, and apprehension. So even though you have arrived, it may not feel that way today. But whatever feeling you or I might be carrying around, the truth is that if we know Jesus, we've arrived. If he is truly your Lord and King, you are sitting at his table, and that is where you are supposed to be. But hear this. If you have arrived at knowing the Father and the Son and enjoying life with the Spirit, you must remain. You must not depart. And this will be a great struggle to remain at the table of the King. You see, we may struggle like those recently freed Hebrew slaves who wait for Moses and say he's long in coming and construct for themselves an idol out of gold. We may struggle like David who stares from afar at Bathsheba and allows the natural desires of his flesh to pursue a conduct, a a context, and a behavior that God had not ordained. You and I may struggle like Peter, who sees the turning tides at the arrest of Jesus and full of fear begins to cry out, I don't know the man. This week, my own thoughts have been sullied by anxiety and threats of despair. And it should come as no shock that as I felt that, I struggled to remain. My daily prayer in scripture reading was shortened, condensed, and on one occasion set aside almost entirely for what felt most urgent. To remain is a labor, for the flesh is weak, the eyes covet, and the world is deceitful. But I believe that the thrust of scripture tells us that this reality we arrived in, we can remain in. And so this challenge sets before us to remain. Now, the text doesn't tell us specifically how. For that, we have to look at the comprehensive message of Scripture. I've included a few ways that I think we can be encouraged to remain. The Bible teaches that we can remain if we confess our sins with one another, knowing that there is strength when God's people weep and pray together. We can remain if we pursue accountability with fellow believers in our waywardness and invite them into the process of our struggle. We can remain if we initiate time to pray and study God's word each and every day, knowing that the strength of the Spirit is in these activities. We can remain if we reorient our lives and our schedules so that we devote more of our time, our energy, and our resources to things that are eternal and not the things that are passing away. And perhaps one of the most challenging ones, we can remain if we just cut out that sin that keeps plaguing us. If we just say, I'm going to ditch the smartphone if it causes me to sin. I'm gonna take alcohol out of my house if it causes me to sin. I'm gonna stop running around with that girl or that guy if they cause me to sin. And so this morning, I don't know how the Lord would prompt you to remain. I don't know how you are experiencing this pull, this desire to move into things of this world. But I do know that the Lord will direct you if you ask him. And so today, as we pray, I'm going to ask our prayer team to come up. And our prayer team would love to pray with you and ask the Lord's direction, his encouragement, as you seek to be someone who remains. 
that will hear your confession and pray for God's grace in your life. But I want for us this week to carry this question, how am I being called to remain? You see, this isn't a black and white question. This isn't something that is always easy to answer because many times in our life we are actually remaining in most areas. We're this big section of our life that we're like, I'm with you, Jesus, I'm with you, Jesus. And there are these small little idols that we're worshiping or these small segments of who we are that we have not given up. And so to ask this question, how am I being called to remain, requires us to be truly evaluative, to ask the Lord what needs to go so that I can remain, what needs to change so that I can remain, what do I need to embrace so that I can remain. And I believe that for us as a faith community this week, this question is pivotal. Because I know that many of you feel like you've never been invited anywhere. Well, John says that you have been invited here to the table. I know that many of you felt like you've never really belonged anywhere. John says that you belong here at the table. I know that many of you feel like you have never been known. I think John says here you will be known by the Father, the Son, and the Spirit at this table. But for us to embrace it, for us to engage it, We must know that we've been invited. We must accept the invitation, and then we must remain. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we pray right now that you would search us, that you would know us, Would you point out the places in our lives right now that draw us away from the home that you've invited us into? Holy Spirit, I pray right now for my brothers and sisters who are here that feel the desires of their flesh drawing them away from you. The temptation to look a certain way the temptation to gratify something they feel deep within them. I pray that you would be with them, Lord. I pray for those who are dealing with impact of something that they haven't even chosen but maybe was done to them that cultivates this fleshly desire to fear, to live in shame, to live with a weight each and every morning when they they wake up, Lord. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would invite them into a process of healing with you so they might be someone who remains. I pray for my brothers and sisters here who feel that desire to delight in the pride of life, to reflect on the things that have been done for them or that they have accomplished and to have that build their identity and reject the identity that you want to instill in them, Lord, I pray for them that you would convict, that you would reveal, and that you would move them, Lord, to a life where they can see themselves first and foremost as your child who sits at your table and enjoys the benefits of being with the King. I pray, Lord, that you would pursue us aggressively this week with the question, what do we have to do to remain? And might we be bold enough to choose to engage you with a response. We pray this in Christ. Amen.